I had lost everything that I'd ever had. My marriage had disintegrated. I'd lost my children. And I didn't really know who I was. I pointed the gun to my chest and I pulled the trigger. There's not a single veteran that I know who doesn't know somebody who's committed suicide. 55% of veterans treated by the VA have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder. We don't even know what's gonna hit us in the next 10 years as a result of the past dozen years of war. It's madness. You couldn't have drawn up a more catastrophic way to fail to meet mental health needs than the blueprints that were followed in this war and that were followed in previous wars. We were not allowed to speak of the unseen wounds of war. We were not allowed to prepare for them. Nobody ever told us about PTSD or what to expect. I was the only credentialed mental health provider for 6,000 Marines. As a Marine, I felt that was an absolute betrayal. We were leaving people behind. You could practically see the demons just raging around inside of him. What happened just fractured him in a really fundamental way. And he's just like, I gotta do this, even if it's gonna hurt. I wanted to know more about it, but he wouldn't let me in. He just wanted to escape. I've been afraid for what I'm gonna have to go through. We're failing at, at, at that healing part. Something's got to give. It would make me upset when people would come up to me and say, oh, thank you for your service. Welcome home. What do you know about living with these memories? We have to stop referring to veterans as sick. They are holding something for us. How do we approach it in a non-medical, social, political way? The battleground's right here. How many lives can we really affect? How many people's lives we can improve? This is terrifying. You need to talk to me if you let me. That's how a guy gets his life back. Let's hear it for our military. We'd like to thank you. How are you guys doing today? Very good. Thanks, Charles. Well, that's a powerful, uh, beautiful trailer for a very powerful Thank you, man. movie. Uh, congratulations. Um, I'm going to start with you, Tom, and Alan, obviously. Um, let us know how this movie came to be. What was the driving force for you to start this project? It's a, it's a tough project, obviously. It's, it's a tough thing to live with for as many days as I'm sure you did. It was, and it definitely had emotional consequences uh, diving into this topic. But there was an op-ed by Nicholas Kristof in 2012 called A Veteran's Death, A Nation's Shame. And it was about the suicide epidemic in the military. And a family foundation approached us about making a film about the topic. And uh, I had a, a best friend who hanged himself when he was 21 in college. My dad was a veteran, 1946 to 1950. So it was an issue that, that deeply connected to me. And we both agreed to kind of go on this journey. We ended up going to 55 cities and interviewed over 240 people around the country. And it was just an incredible experience. Because um, initially we didn't know what our story was, we just knew there was a big problem. And our, our main investor said, Gerald Sprayragan, said, I don't want you just to do a movie about the problem. I want you to figure out what's wrong and come up with potential solutions. So that was what was in our head. And it took a good six months into production before we kind of knew what the solutions could be and what the stories were. Yeah, and I, I think it is one of those things where the, the more you get out there and the more you start talking about it, everybody's touched by this in some way. Somebody's got a family member that was in the service or knew somebody who was in the service or you know, went to school with somebody who was in the service. So I'm sure those stories started to come out to you and then how did you find people like Will, people like Phil, you know, how did you find the people that had the stories to tell and also had the willingness to tell them? You know, why don't well, you, guys you create a huge network of people when you interview 240 people. So actually both of these guys, Phil and William who are here, uh, came through other veterans who we interviewed and they said, hey, do you mind if my friend comes and watches? Mm -hmm. You know, they're veterans. And we'll say, okay, sure. And then I think Alan approached William. Yeah, I started talking to William. I said, what's your story? And he said, oh, you want to hear a story? I got a story for you. He was in the back of the room with his sunglasses on, all attitude. He's like, oh, you want to hear my story, do you? <laughs> I'll tell you my story. Storytellers, huh? <laughs> I got a story for you right here. And then he was amazing. Yeah. And, and why don't you tell us, William, about 
you know, what your interpretation was of the project at first and then what you came to learn about. Because, I mean, there's a lot of media out there, obviously, about these, you know, soldiers. You know, it's, you know, there's a lot of movies, a lot of TV shows. We see a lot of things. And I'm sure the first of all concern is, is it being done right? Is it being done to the standard that I'd like to see as a person who served myself? You know, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, when this, this project was shot, what, three and a half years ago? So at that time, it was... It was just starting to come out, right? The, the 22 a day statistic had just come up from 18 and it was starting to get notoriety. And um, yeah, it, it was, I think what attracted me to it is, is their commitment to do it right, which is why the, the, the production took so long and, and they did so many interviews to do it. And so after that day that we talked about earlier when, when Alan and I were, were, were discussing, they said, hey, do you wanna go to USC? And, and, and do a roundtable discussion with a guy named Anthony Hassan um, about PTSD and to continue on with the film. And um, as the universe does sometimes, you know, your life just sort of follows that trajectory. Uh, we did that and then they said, um, hey, you wanna go up with a guy named Phil who happens to be in the, in the back over there. Uh, do you wanna, yeah, do you wanna go with a guy named Phil to uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and take part in a, in a Sioux reintegration ceremony and a wild horse roundup and that sort of stuff. And I'm like, what? You know, what are, what are we going to do? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it was kind of one of those things where you, just, where you just follow your heart, follow the faith, and just say, all right, well, I guess this is what we're going to do. And then that sort of, sort of changes the trajectory of, of, of your life, and then you get involved in such a, such a worth, worthwhile cause, right? The Behavioral Health Corps has the potential to change the way the military does mental health forever. And, and who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Something that's... Well, you should explain that, yeah. In, in the big problem we found is there's this big neglect of mental health issues within the military, and there's a big stigma regarding mental health because there is, there's a lack of accountability. There's no chain of command for behavioral health the way there is for, for instance, the medical corps, yeah. the veterinary corps, the dental corps. Yeah. So we need a behavioral health corps, and that's, that's one big thing the film argues. We're basically arguing that um, mental health is important from the moment they enlist or become part of the armed services, and that it needs to be on the same par as physical well-being, that their mental well-being needs to be on the same par. Yeah, I, I will say that's one of the both fascinating and also devastating things about this film is, is you learn even from World War II, you know, these statistics have been out there forever. I mean, we have 25 guys a day, you know, committing suicide. We have 20 guys, we have, then it's 22. You know, the number keeps on fluctuating, but it's, it's still, you know, one a day is, is too much. So, you know, it's is about trying to move the needle, and, and that's, I think, what this film does so well. And I'm sure, you know, once you start talking to, to guys from you know, Operation Iraqi Freedom, I'm sure you're getting the guys from, you know, Vietnam, World War II. I mean, I mean, is it almost staggering to cut down a documentary to two hours when it's, you're telling the story of, you know, three generations? Yeah. It's actually 87 minutes, but we did hundreds of hours of interviews. with. We have whole movies on the cutting room floor. We have like five 95-year-old World War II veterans who are fantastic, but ultimately it just had to, with a documentary, you have to focus it. Too much information, too many talking heads, and your eyes glaze over watching it. So it still has to have a three-act structure to be effective. And, and uh, you know, you speak a little bit about the DOD and the VA right now, the Veterans Affairs. You know, obviously there's a lot of news happening right now with, you know, presidential candidates saying certain things about PTSD. And now the awareness, there's a there's an ability to spread more awareness and, and, and to share more of the facts that are out there. I mean, what are your thoughts on sort of that, that news that happened, you know, yesterday, obviously? We're always excited um, when yeah. people are talking about the mental health of uh, our military folks and our veterans. Always, for whatever the reason. And we've talked to both campaigns about the idea of a behavioral health corps, and they're listening, which is fantastic. That's Hopefully great. Hopefully it'll keep going after November 8th. Yeah, and, and what do you think about the you know, Republican nominee's uh, yeah. statements and uh, how that was interpreted by the media and such? Sure. Well, I, I think I want, to, I want to be careful about this issue because this issue affects everybody across both, both aisles or no matter what. And so... Like, like Tom said, the fact that they're having this discussion when it's been going on since at least Vietnam where we've been able to keep data, right, that this suicide epidemic is, is atrocious. And the fact that presidential candidates are, are discussing it, are being open to, to discussing ideas on what can be done about it, I think shows that we're making progress. That regardless of what political party you're with, that we can come together and say, not on this issue. This isn't gonna be a partisan issue. We're gonna, we're gonna stand together on this and say this is too much. 
Yeah, one, one of the reasons that it's so important to be part of the conversation is that the two biggest problems are stigma and barriers to care. And the more it's discussed, the more it's out there in the conversation, the greater you can help reduce the stigma. And, and Will, you know, what has been your progress, you know, since the, the wrapping of this? Obviously, you could tell another another story about, you know, the, the progress that you made, you know, the Save the Warrior Fund, uh, Save a Warrior Foundation, I think it was called. Yeah, exactly. It was the great one that's featured in this. But there's, there's mil you know, there's there's hundreds of them starting to pop up now. This is like a concern that's nationwide. What what's has it been for you? Yeah. So there's like 30,000 veteran service organizations out there. Um, and I, I think... The issue becomes, it's like a fractured mirror, but a lot of people are doing great work. And, I, I, and we're starting with the collective conversation to bring a lot of these organizations together and join up instead of everybody competing over one another. Um, so that's, that, that, that is a sign that we're, we're headed in the right direction. So my story, I, was, I, I, I had got out and I, I didn't know what the hell I was gonna do. And so I, I, went to, uh, I went to school on the GI Bill, and I figured, well, I'll just try to do something like this. And then one thing led to another, and then I was able to um, start to look at, look at myself and, and, and how I was self-medicating and, and, and how I was uh, dealing with my, my transition and war trauma and that sort of stuff. And, and then I started studying PTSD, and I was lucky enough to be a part of a program at the University of Southern California uh, that has a military-specific social work program. Mm -hmm. and, I, I was so blessed to, to have learned from them, but then to find out that at that time they were they were one of the only ones, one of the only trauma. They were the only one. Yeah, they were the only ones. You know, I just didn't want to ex exclude in case there was one other one hiding. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, to say like this is the only one in the whole country that 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 studies like military trauma. You're like like that that can't be. And then so it became part of the establishment of of BHC now to say. Not only do we want to establish a behavioral health core within the military, but we also want to increase access to education for colleges across the country mm -hmm. to start studying this. Because trauma isn't just focused on veterans, right? Trauma is trauma. Life is hard, and, and how, you, how you respond to that. And to, so when we have more people understanding that there can be post-traumatic growth, then I think we can start to move forward collectively as a whole, not just with veterans. Yeah, and, and Tom, you know, you know, speaking a little bit about, you know, these, these interviews that you got, obviously you got, you know, Gary Sinise, who's an actor who's been very heavily involved with Veterans Affairs. Um, you've got secretaries, you, you know, secretaries of state, you got very, people in high levels of position who are talking about these issues. I mean, what was it that you learned? I mean, what did you, was it, was it tough to hear the facts? It was. Well, I learned that they are very aware of the issues, the ones who are willing to speak to us on camera. And there's a lot of, there's a sense of frustration and hopelessness that you have to kind of wring your hands of it. And yet you also have to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. So it was really, what was sad was seeing the neglect at the top levels of government mm -hmm. toward this issue. Yeah. In talking to, obviously, there's Mark Russell's in here, who is a, a health professional who's working on TBI and that sort of thing and all that research. I mean, what was it that you were learning about, um, you know, what the psychiatrists are dealing with, what they're up against, and, and, and how they're trying to evolve their methods? Well, we went for the first six months uh, just talking to, to veterans, thinking, what is this movie? What does this movie have to be? And then in April of 2013, we sat down in Seattle, and uh, we met Dr. Mark Russell, who was a psychologist in the Navy for 26 years. As he was a Marine for 10 years, psychologist for 16 years. And he laid it all out. He had an incredible vision of how this problem cannot be solved, but how, can be, how it can be handled, how it can be ameliorated. And uh, we realized when we met Mark that, wow, this is, this is our guy. This is the, and he's a whistleblower. He, he spoke to a convention of 200 medical professionals, and he laid it out. And this is when nobody was talking about this issue three years into the war. He made the cover of USA Today. The Navy was not happy with him. They, they threw out talking points, many of some of which were not true, to try to kind of tamp down the situation. But that really started the conversation within the military and within the public about this issue and that something had to be done. Yeah, and, and you know, as a, as, a, as a filmmaker, I mean, what's the, the difficulty for you in that situation? You're in a room with somebody who maybe held a high position or maybe is in, still in a high position and you have all these facts, you've talked to the guys, you know the issues. Um, I mean, how do you press without having the interview subject, you know, take off the mic and leave, you know? How, how do you handle that difficult situation? You just have to meet them where they're at and 
they know that you want answers and they're ready to give them. And a lot of interviewing is just staying silent and letting them fill the gaps. Yeah, in in a very funny moment, Tom actually had a staring contest with a particular general. <laughs> oh, I had a contest with General Petraeus, and, and I won. <laughs> so, sorry. And, and as producer, I mean, what's, what's your, obviously you're in the room, you're feeling the tension, you're trying to negotiate both sides of this issue. You know, how, do you, how are you, obviously you're on the side of the film, but you're trying to keep the subject there, you're trying to keep everybody in the room happy. I mean, what's your balance? What's your, what's your delicate balance in this situation? It's different for every film, but for this film, um, the uniform thing is that whoever went on camera really had a story to tell. They wanted to tell their story. So our job was not only to make them feel comfortable, make sure that they knew that they were in a safe place and we weren't out there to exploit their stories and actually really communicate and tell their stories and that really get, get a sense that it's part of the fabric of a greater story we're trying to tell. So the real challenge is making sure that we're constantly sort of on point and there's a certain trust factor, especially with the high level officials, but especially Phil and William who went on this journey with us. They, they traveled with us for months making the film, not only the year afterwards since we first started getting the film out there. And yeah, we learned how great they are. I mean, these are people who really want to be of service. And if they go in front of the camera, actually Phil said, he goes, listen, dude, I don't want to be, I don't want to be on camera. I don't want to tell my story. But if it's going to save one life, I will do it because that's my duty. And that's how they feel. It's an incredible sense of responsibility. Yeah. We, we definitely took that to heart. I mean, Tom and I definitely feel that we had a sense of duty in telling this story. And I think the people who went on camera understood that and that they felt it was their duty also to tell their story. Yeah, so, so Will, why don't you speak a little bit about how it, how it was to build that trust, obviously. You know, you have the story to tell. You've got things you want to tap into, but we spoke, we've, you know, spoke about the stigmatization you know, of, uh, of, of keeping a brave face, of being a soldier, of toughing it out, having grit, all that sort of things that make you sort of push those emotions aside. I mean, yeah. what it take, what level of sort of relationship or sort of... Um, uh, I guess, um, how much time did it take to build that trust that you're able to tap into what you show in this film, which is, you know, fantastic? Sure. I, I think I, uh, I built the, the trust around South Dakota. We were outside, and we were around the horses, and we were working, and Phil and I were, were, were connecting, and it was, it was, like I say in the film, it was just like being part of a squad. And then I started to understand that we can we can have a, a very positive impact in the lives of others. And now that we're in a position to do so, we sort of owe it, mm. right? Like there's, there's, there's no reason for us to, 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 to bow out now, mm. right? It's time to practice what we preach. And if, if our story can, like, like, like Phil said, if our story can save somebody's life, then, um, then, then, it, it, then it's well worth it. But also just to look at it from the, from the side of saying that, it's okay to talk about these issues. It's okay to, to come home and to feel lost and confused. Whether we want to label it PTSD or transition or whatever it is, soldiers have been coming home and, and needing to reintegrate and needing support for a very long time. And I think that, that, that our servicemen and women are uniquely suited to make huge contributions in our communities. If only we can help support them in the transition process. And so then it became a sort of an act of service just to say, hey, no, 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 we, 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 we need to step up. And through that service, it has most certainly helped my healing, right, to, to, to give to others. I think that's when you look at people who go through trauma, that's sort of the, the, the golden thread, right, is their, their ability to want to help and, and to serve others, which is, you know, in turn, helping them serve themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um Tom, you know, what has been the response, and Alon, you can answer to this as well, what has been the response from guys who've seen it who weren't involved with the process? Obviously, these guys are sharing their stories and, and, and they feel comfortable with you, but, you know, you're going into these, I'm sure you've been showing it to other soldiers since, and what's been their reaction, and, and what's their reaction in general to the state of affairs uh, between, you know, the civilian side and the, the, the army? Uh, it's been amazing to watch this film with an audience of both civilians and veterans. And the veterans, out, afterwards, they, they crowd around you. And we talk, we also do Q&As after. Because you can't just watch this film and go home. Yeah. You gotta talk about it. And so we have these hour-long conversations. We've had Vietnam veterans stand up. They'll tell their stories. There's a lot of crying. Uh, civilians who come up and say, this film changed my life. I didn't know about this problem. Or I had my own trauma. And it, I was stigmatized. I'm not a veteran, but a lot of people who have trauma but are civilians can connect to what these guys go through in the movie. Uh, 
and in terms of on the in the political sphere. So we've been traveling um, pretty consistently down to Washington D.C. Uh, all of us, the entire crew, um, the veterans as well, and we're starting to make a slow impact. Uh, last week or two weeks ago, we had our D.C. premiere. We had four U.S. senators host the screening. They all got up and stood. Um, they engaged in the Q&A afterwards. They engaged in the in the conversations after the fact. They've all committed now to doing screenings in their home state as well as doing a screening for the entire Armed Services Committee and possibly all of Congress as Which well. Which would be incredible. Yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, on top of that, obviously, you know, as a documentary film, you know, people are out there just trying to consume entertainment. So there's a little bit you guys have to do to get the word out there. I mean, how can people, you know, what are the organizations out there that are doing the good work? You know, how can people find this film? You know, tell us about sure. what the people can, out there can do to, to well, move our, the situation along. Our distributor uh, is opening the film in New York, L.A., and D.C., but it's in one theater in each city, hard to get to. But what we're also doing is called a theatrical on-demand model. So you can captain a screening in your community. You go to typhusfilm.com, T-Y-F-Y-S film.com, and you can sign up and you can stand up in your community and say, I want to bring the film to my local multiplex. Mm. And you have to sell a certain number of tickets, and that tips the screening, and then it's on, and you can show it. That's great. Well, uh, do you have any of these screenings planned, or do you have any friends out there, I'm sure, are very excited to see your debut on the on-demand side? or? Yeah, I just want to show it to as many people as possible. Once again, this is about having a having a conversation and, and standing together and, and and really really focusing on a change that we can actually get done. I mean, we've we've been involved in this process for a little under a year, and we're like I said, we're already speaking to the Armed Services Committee and 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 moving moving things forward. So I think it's just a testament to if you if we focus and, and stay together, that that we can actually get something done in a world where you know a lot of things seem hopeless. You know, this is an issue that, that we can this actually make This is an issue that people can unite around on both sides yeah. of the aisle. Yeah. It's definitely nonpartisan. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, obviously I'm sure there is a lot of uh, stories left to tell. I mean, do you, do you find yourself wanting to do another film around this subject or about the progress, or is this sort of like a... Well, we still have a long way to go yeah. with, with this film. It's at least another year of, of the roadshow model before we go to broadcast with it. Mm -hmm. So that's really our... And I'm making, we're making another project now at the same time. So we're going to stick with this one for a while. And That's great. And Will, what's next for you? How are you doing? And uh, how's, how's the crew doing from the film that we can see? Yeah, I, I think I, I think everybody's doing well. I think you know the more momentum we get, the, the you know like the more energy we have to to keep going. And you know, we I, I speak to widows of of, of of soldiers and you know individuals that have committed suicide, and you know their story and their encouragement to like what they're going through, and and it's it's becoming a, it's becoming a huge community mm -hmm. of individuals that are not suffering in silence anymore. But, but having an outlet to, to promote change and to tell their story. And for that, it's an absolute honor to, to be a part of it. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. That's fantastic. And I, I think we have a couple questions out in the audience right there. Oh. Is it on? Uh, for those um, of us that are not familiar with the mental illness in depth like you guys are, um, especially for Will, um, what can you uh, tell us that will be able to help us help other people in the situation and then um, are you, do you experience most of the symptoms once the person is home as opposed to being, you know, out in battle on the field, having to be strong and, you know, having to, you know, you know, face another day and it's just, everything's just bottled up and do you experience most of the issues when coming home and being around civilians and, and coming to a place where you know the rest of the world doesn't look like? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's a great question. I think that when you're in the military, you, you still have sort of a bubble, right? You're in a bubble, and you, you still fall under that identity. You're Sergeant so-and-so or Lieutenant so-and-so. But when you get home, right, because the military breaks you down as an individual and then builds you back up as part of a team. But then when you get out, you're an individual again, and they don't teach you about that whole process. And then so then you, you in a sense, lose your, lose your identity. Now you're... you're just a regular person. And that compared with the idea that, that it seems to a lot of servicemen and women that only some of us are at war, right? We've been at war for a long time now and only some of us are at war. And so that divide certainly doesn't, doesn't help, right? The idea that no matter how we feel about war itself, that, that collectively we are all in this together, I think can, can really help. So to answer your question, I think that it, it really hits home after you separate. Um, and 
And I, I think that the worst thing that, and, and what's very common for, for veterans to do is this whole idea of, well, you wouldn't understand, right? You wouldn't understand what I'm going through, so I don't want to tell you. Well, I don't understand what your life is like, right? But we can have a conversation. So that's just a defense mechanism to say, oh, well, you, you don't understand, right? Nobody understands. And the only way we can understand is by, by opening up and having an, having an honest conversation and meeting each other as, as human beings. And I think that the more we do that and sort of leave the, the, uh, the idea of stigma and mental health and uh, politics and all of that sort of thing aside and just saying, how are you doing? Then I, I think that, that that's, that's how we heal collectively. Hi, um, thank you so much for making this. And I just wanted to know if there's any kind of organizations you'd like to highlight or things that we can volunteer for or what we can do other than getting the word out. Sure, you want to take this lead? Where, where do we start? Yeah, well, I mean, in the film, we have uh, Save a Warrior, a wonderful retreat organization. I work with a retreat organization called the Phoenix Rising Project, another organization called Purple Star Veterans and Families that actually helps uh, the, the service uh, member's family Right, because they are the they're they're the un, unsung heroes. Right, they're the ones that have to deal with with the individual in coping and everything else. Uh, and they they often are excluded from support. So the caregivers, we we owe them so so much. And there's just so few resources out there for them. But yeah, there's there's a lot of wonderful organization, local VFWs and American Legions. And the American Red Cross has also been very supportive of our film and has sponsored a, a bunch of the screenings around the country. We also ourselves as filmmakers, you know, our job is to make films. Um, but at the same time, we knew that the mission of the film just can't end with the film itself. So we started our own non nonprofit called the Military Behavioral Health Initiative. And the website is bhcnow.com, which you can go to, which is the idea of creating education and awareness around the ideas that we espouse in the film and primarily the behavioral health core. Yeah. And that you can go to bhcnow.com, bhcnow.com. Yeah. And I think, once again, the idea is that there's no one-size-fits-all solution to this issue, right? There's a lot of wonderful organizations that are meeting people right where they are, and, and the more people we can get involved in supporting them and their good work, the, the, the better. That's great. We have uh, one more question right there. Hi. How are you guys doing today? Um, I, as a military veteran, I wanted to say thank you for making this. Um, I'm service-connected with post-traumatic stress disorder, so I can relate with what you guys are, are trying to broaden um, and, and, and acknowledge. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you, brother. Um, thank you, man. What I want to ask is um, you guys brought this, you know, made this movie and have dealt closely with the VA and people that have become service connected. It took me almost six months uh, to be seen mm -hmm. for my, what they call behavioral health issues after being disconnected um, from the military. So, I was wondering if you noticed that length of time getting shortened or if there's more doctors or, or more veterans being seen for this because when I got disconnected in 2014, I mean, it wasn't a big thing. People, they were still seriously trying to figure out what it was that was causing so many veterans to take their own lives. I, thank God, had a really decent support system when I came home and if it wasn't for my family and my friends, I don't know what would have happened. I've also lost three or three really decent, you know, human beings and friends and battle buddies since I've been home. So if you could recommend what you think the VA should be doing or stepping up and doing, uh, uh, I would really love to hear your opinion on it. Because I mean, I feel like I get better treatment from the Wounded Warrior Project or other organizations outside of the VA than I do from my own treatment at the VA hospital, so. You want to take that one? Yeah. Um, first off, I, I think, and, and I also had to wait a very long time. Like, I didn't get a rating for like four or five years or something like that. Some, you know, it, it, it became a, a kind of a hopeless, hopeless endeavor. You're just constantly filing paperwork. And we're not all that good at paperwork anyway, you know, and I, I think they kind of know that uh, instinctively. But I always am grateful to the men and women of the VA because they're working their asses off to. Uh, to focus on veterans, and they have to fight through a lot of red tape, right? So, so to have a VA to complain about it is is a wonderful thing. But in that, in the same same breath, they they haven't done as much as they should. And I think that they can they can expand by working together with the other um, VSOs, 
right, and, and, and helping to fund them, helping to, to bring them in, instead of saying, okay, you guys are just going to be a privately funded entity, and good luck, and see if you can help some guys, it, you know, to make this, the more people that are involved in this issue, the, 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 the more we're going to be able to get done, and so I think, I think things are starting to move that way, which is a wonderful thing, but going back to the need for unity and collective voice, that's, that's how we're gonna get that. Because now that people understand this issue, there's, no way, there's nowhere for them to run, right? And we, we owe it to the generations before us and the generations after us to, to not, not, let this, not let this lesson go and have to relearn it later on, right? To, but, but instead just to say, no, 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 we're, 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 gonna, do, we're gonna do something about this. And they're, they're actively listening. They're, they're actively listening. Now, their, their bureaucracy takes a long time to start to turn around, but slowly we're starting to see them, you know, see them make changes that, that, are, that are helping, decreasing wait times and, and those sorts of things, increasing access to external care, right? It's not enough, but it's, it's a step, step in the right direction. But also the, the problem, the VA is overwhelmed because the problem is not being properly addressed in the military. Yeah. So the military really needs to get its act together and fix this issue with the chain of command and accountability regarding mental health, these guys are gonna get out understanding a lot better of what they're going through before they have to get help at the VA. Yeah. Rather than just leaving it as a VA problem. Sure. Right. And in the military, somebody's in charge of everything, right? But nobody's in charge of mental health. Explain that. And so, th because there is no behavioral health core, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers all fall under different cores which limits their ability to effectively communicate and to work together in order to come up with the best practices model. Is it okay if I just, um, we're afraid to talk about it. Mm. You know, we're afraid to be looked at like lepers mm -hmm. or people right. that can't do our jobs. Sure. To have our weapons taken from us mm -hmm. is, is like taking our yeah. lives sure. or our limbs. Yeah. So once we start talking about, hey, we have a problem that we can't control uh, and we get in a night sweat, so you feel, you know, like you're overcoming something that you, um, that you can't control, you know, to, to go and approach your chain of command or go to a doctor and talk about it is something that's really, it's frowned upon and yeah. it's hard to really take that leap of faith that there's gonna be a support system to help you and not think that you're crazy. Sure. So I think once that gets changed in the military and it's more accessible and, and, and looked at in the proper light Mm -hmm. and approached correctly, mm -hmm. more yeah, veterans will right. seek help earlier and they won't have eight years of, of, of these issues that are over flooding them and making them take their own lives and feeling like that's the only way out. Yeah, exactly um, right. So that's, that's the so, biggest thing. It's not being approached right yeah. during the service time. Mm -hmm. And then you're getting out and you're coming back into society. You, you don't know how to control, you know? You weren't paying bills, you weren't dealing with the family troubles, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, you, all of these these floodgates open, yeah. and you're dealing with all these, you know, all of these emotions, and it's it's hard to control. Yeah. You know these everyday feelings that you weren't having when you were in the military. So, per well said. Yeah, very thank well you. said. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. Absolutely. Obviously, this is an important documentary about a very poignant topic, and everybody just do what you can. You know, host a screening. You know, talk. You know, speak. I think that's the most important thing that we've learned. You know, let's be open about it, you know. October 28th, AMC 25 in Times Square. So come check it out. Bring your friends. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for coming. One more hand. Thank you. Thank you.